So right now, there's a big film out there, which we're all going to see, which is Oppenheimer, right? I thought it was amazing. I got serious physics fanboy vibes. I loved it. So I thought it would be nice to sort of talk a little bit about Oppenheimer, but I didn't, I didn't see any point in talking about the, the, the whole atomic bomb project, the Manhattan Project, because obviously that's big in the film. I thought I'd talk about some of Oppenheimer's great physics prior to that, of which there is some really great physics. So I've picked out four papers that I think are probably his four most important papers in, in my view. And the funny thing about them is, is that I think every single one of these papers, now Oppenheimer never won a Nobel Prize, right? But I think every single one of these four papers has led to somebody else getting a Nobel Prize. <laughs> right? This just sort of demonstrates, you know, Oppenheimer wasn't just about the Manhattan Project and the, and the leadership he showed there, whatever you think about that. It, he, he, was, he was a great physicist, and so I think we should talk about that. First paper, right, first paper. Now, they do mention this paper in the film, his paper with Max Born in 1927. So Max Born was one of the um, you know, great physicists, won the Nobel Prize in, I think, 1954 uh, for his work on the foundations of quantum mechanics. But do you know who his granddaughter was? Was it Olivia Newton-John? It is Olivia Newton-John, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Random. Olivia Newton-John is his granddaughter. Anyway, we're not here to talk about Max Born. We're here to talk about Oppenheimer. Well, we're here to talk about this paper. OK, so what is this paper about? This is their 1927 paper on, basically, molecular quantum mechanics. As I said, they talk about it in the film, but briefly. So what, 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 is it, what does it do? What, what, what even is this? OK, so... What they're doing is, so, so this is right at the beginning of quantum mechanics, and people are using this new theory to try to describe, say, atoms and understand this sort of spectrum of these atoms, you know, the, the locations of their energy levels and so on. So these guys wanted to apply that to molecules, so a much more complicated problem. Um, but they wanted to essentially try to figure things out for, for molecules. How did, but, so I wanted, I wanted to sort of demonstrate kind of what they did. So I'm going to, I've got some... I'm going to make a molecule, right, to try and illustrate what, what um, Born and Oppenheimer did. The molecules have gone bloody everywhere. Right, okay, so these, these are not molecules. These are going to be my nuclei. So I've got some big molecule. It's got lot, a big molecule has lots of nuclei and lots of electrons floating around. So these are the nuclei. These are going to be the nuclei. Imagine there's loads of these guys, right? You know, different nuclei in, 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 in this molecule. And I've also got a bunch of electrons floating around them. These are my brother's old marbles. I don't know why I got them, but anyway. <laughs> so we got a load of electrons. You're going to regret that. Well, I have regret it already. So I got a load of electrons floating around these, these nuclei. Very complex. Loads of, you know, there's loads of electrons. There's loads of nuclei. It's a very complex problem, mathematically. So what, what's, what the, these guys were trying to do is they were trying to apply Schrodinger's equation to this, to this problem. Schrodinger's equation is the sort of, it's the equation, one of the main equations of quantum mechanics developed a few years earlier by, by Erwin Schrodinger, and it, it allows you to sort of calculate those, those energy levels, those, you know, to the spectral lines of, of these, whatever you're interested in, an atom, or in this case, a molecule. For a molecule, it's complicated. Why? Because you've got all these electrons with all their different positions. You've got all these nuclei with all their different positions. It's a really complicated equation to try to solve. So Oppenheimer and, and Born, they said, well, OK, we need, this is too hard. We can't, we can't possibly handle this this way. So they, they came up with a really clever approximation scheme to try to solve it. So you've got to remember that in reality, all these things are whizzing around, right? They're moving about and so on and so forth, right? But, but what... Born and Oppenheimer realized was this, that actually these nuclei, right, these guys, are actually much heavier than these electrons. Okay, so nuclei are much heavier. So there's an approximation which works really well where you can assume that these guys are not moving, okay, whereas the electrons are. So you assume, so some approximation that these guys are not moving. So you do the calculation assuming that these guys are fixed, they're fixed in space, and you allow all the electrons to whiz around. And you, sh you solve for the electronic energy levels, the energy levels from the electronic system, you know, the electrons themselves. You solve that, and you get an answer. And it's a number, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an energy that depends on where you put these. Okay? So if you put them in a slightly different place, you might get a slightly different answer. But whatever the answer, but they're still fixed, but the answer that you get for the energies of, uh, levels of these, this electronic system is coming, depends on the locations of these things. Okay, so that's the first pass. Then what they do is they feed that answer for the electronic energy levels into the full system again, and they start allowing these nuclei to move, okay? 
but they move in a potential set up by the electrons that he's just calculated. And then they use that to then go again with Schrodinger's equation and solve for the full system and get the full set of energy levels for the, for the whole molecule. In a really, really reducing the complexity of the problem and getting a really good approximation. And what are you getting an approximation of? The final answer that spits out at the end is energy levels. Or? It's the energy levels, it's the spectrum of the, of the molecule, so the different energy levels that, that it can have, right? So that's, that's what you're doing when you're doing quantum physics, that's the kind of thing you're interested in. So yeah, that's, that's what they were after. In much the same way atoms have energy levels, exactly. molecules have energy levels. Exactly, exactly. But it's a much more mathematically complicated problem to solve in the case of molecules because it's just, just <laughs> look at the mess. <laughs> there's so much stuff here. And there's, I've only got three nuclei here. In reality, you're going to have a lot more. Okay, so it's a very complicated problem, but they managed to find... It's a classic physicist technique. Let's look at a problem. Let's, okay, this is way too complicated to solve. I've got the right equation, but I can't solve that equation as it is. I need to figure out what is the physics that allows me to sort of get to an answer that I can use. And the physics here is that the nuclei are actually just a lot, a lot heavier than the electrons. So interestingly, this, so this is really, really important result in chemistry. So I decided to ask Martin about it, Martin Polykoff, who does your periodic videos. I asked him, you know, what's, give me a flavour of the impact of this. And Martin told me, that he said, yeah, born Oppenheimer approximation, it's really, really important in chemistry. He said, but he hadn't realised until watching the film that it was the same guy who did the atomic bomb. <laughs> I was like, Martin, come on. So the, the 2013 Nobel Prize for Chemistry was, was basically really using born Oppenheimer approximation and what it did. And there's even, the born Oppenheimer approximation is so important in chemistry that there's even a branch of chemistry which is not doing the born Oppenheimer approximation. That's how sort of embedded it is in, with it, with, for chemists. So next paper, Oppenheimer on his own. Really short paper, not mentioned in the film at all. It's part of, um, it's only two pages long, as you can see. I think this is his, his Annus Mirabilis, right? You know, people talk about Einstein 1905. I think 1930 was a really impressive year for Oppenheimer, some great papers that year. This is one of them. This is where he essentially predicts the existence of positrons. Now, just almost. Right? It's, it's over. So just a bit of history. So a, a couple of years earlier, Dirac had, uh, we talked about Schrodinger's equation describing quantum mechanics. The thing about Schrodinger's equation, it's not, it's not a relativistic equation. It doesn't, can't, doesn't deal with, it doesn't include the symmetries of, of Einstein's theory of relativity. It's a non-relativistic equation. So people wanted to extend those ideas to, to include Einstein's theory of relativity. So that's what Dirac did, Paul Dirac, the, you know, the British physicist. And he, he came up with, it, with an equation which was a relativistic version, essentially, of, 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 of quantum mechanics. And that equation was to, used to describe the electron. But one of the weird things, to, to make it relativistic, it came at a catch. There were extra solutions to the equation. So the equations didn't just describe an electron. It predicted that there had to be some other ingredient there, another type of particle that actually had the opposite charge to the electron, so a positive charge. So everyone's like, well, it's not like it's another state of the electron because it's not like the ele there's no transition which takes the electron to a positive, you know, to something with positive charge. That's not a thing that exists. So they really thought that this extra solution to Dirac's equation had to be, uh, you know, s s a another particle. Or, uh, you know, it, it, there should be a particle that's with positive charge that we can identify with the other solution to Dirac's equation. And of course, everybody at the time was screaming, well, it's the proton. Right? Obviously, it's the proton, right? Well, Oppenheimer wasn't so sure. So he looked at the arguments in favour of people saying it had to be the proton. Dirac himself was pushing for it to be the proton. Oppenheimer said no. And basically, it's very, really, really simple argument. So he said, if you think this guy's the proton, and this is the theory describing both the proton and the electron, then when you scatter light against, against an electron, it should pretty much behave in the same way as when you scatter light against a proton. And we know that it doesn't. The, 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 the scattering is slightly different. And the difference is, is weighted by the difference in their masses, by the way. And so what Oppenheimer said is actually, this other solution to Dirac's equation is not the proton. It's got to be, a, it must be another particle with positive charge that has the same mass as the electron. Okay? That is the property of the positron. But he stopped short of predicting that it should exist because he didn't quite, his interpretation was he didn't quite buy Dirac's theory wasn't 100% taken by it. There was some other calculations he'd done which 
he thought we're, we're not quite agreeing with experiments. So he wasn't quite convinced by it at that stage. Now, Dirac's equation is basically right. D D Dirac himself then took what Oppenheimer and or Hermann Weyl as well had said afterwards and said, right, okay, this is, this is really predicting another particle. And he predicted the positron, essentially, which was then discovered a few years later. Incidentally discovered, it was discovered by Anderson, but that he gets the credit for it. Anderson gets the credit for discovering the positron, but actually Blackett, who people who've seen the film will know, Blackett features in the film. He's the Cambridge professor at the start of the film, right? He actually discovered it first, but he published it after. So there's a little bit another connection to the film there. But anyway, yeah, positrons essentially predicted by, by Oppenheimer, but he never got the credit for it. Next one. Okay, another 1930 paper. Right? So it's, it's, it's Annus Mirabilis, in my view. Okay, so what's he doing here? Again, he's playing, this is when he was working with Wolfgang Pauli, by the way. Wolfgang Pauli, great physicist, one of the fathers of quantum mechanics, probably head of the Pauli exclusion principle, which is named after him. Very much a, a sort of, you know, no-nonsense physicist as well, actually, but he really respected Oppenheimer. In fact, this is what he said about Oppenheimer. He said that uh, Oppenheimer's uh, physics is always interesting, but his calculations are always wrong. <laughs> right? So, but actually, this is a calculation that... that that, uh, that Pauli had sort of nudged Oppenheimer towards, that, that actually I think he got the calculation right. Anyway, so what was it about? Well, again, they were, they were thinking about, Pauli in particular had been worried about, about the electron, and in particular something called the self-energy. So what, what, what's that? So you think about an electron as a, people talk about the electron as a point particle, and they were talking about it as a point particle then. A particle, a charged particle, moves, you know, it responds to an electromagnetic field, right? It, it, it moves within it. What Pauli realized was that the electron itself was creating its own electromagnetic field. So it should, have, it should respond to its own electromagnetic field. And you can think about this as it, 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 it sort of you, it gives the, the electron an energy. But the problem is the, the energy that you get from its, electromagnetic, its own electromagnetic field, if you do this calculation classically, because the electromagnetic field blows up to infinity at the point of the electron itself, so does the energy it wants to endow the electron with, this self-energy. It blows up, it becomes infinite. So Pauli realised this can't, can't be right. Okay? The electron doesn't behave as if it's got infinite energy, which is the same as infinite mass. It doesn't behave like that. So this had to be wrong. So he said, well, maybe the solution to this, which we're treating this problem classically, maybe if we think about it quantum mechanically, using Dirac's theory, we can take care of this. We can fix this problem. So he set Oppenheimer on it. So Oppenheimer did the calculation. Now he decided to do the calculation, not in a, in a sort of obscure setting, but in a, he wanted to look at the calculation in a physically meaningful setting. So something where, where, where the quantities you, you were actually calculating are physically measurable. So he decided to look at the, at the energy levels of hydrogen, of the hydrogen atom, and the, and, you know, and the electrons in, in, in orbit around it. So, so he calculated this. And indeed, he found that when he went to sort of higher order in his approximations, that indeed an infinite contribution was always there. So this energy of the electron was always getting this infinite contribution. You had to go, it didn't happen at first order approximation, but when you get to next order, higher order in his approximations, this infinite contribution appeared. Now again, his interpretation of this was, oh, the theory's probably just wrong. Right? So the, the, the electron doesn't have this infinite energy, what, what, it doesn't have infinite mass, well, this is obviously just wrong. But no, it wasn't wrong, it was right. It took about 15 years later uh, or so, Feynman, for example, Schwinger, Tom and Arga, they came up with the theory of renormalization, which we, we should probably do a video out, but it's a whole other story. But essentially what, what you do there is you realize that you can add an infinite correction to this and come out with a finite answer. And you can do this in a consistent way that all makes sense and you can make concrete predictions. Okay, so Oppenheimer missed that, but he was, his calculation was really the seed for trying to understand what was really going on. He sowed a lot of seeds. He did sow a lot of seeds. Should we do his final seed? Yeah. Okay, his final seed. Again, this final one is, is alluded to in the film. It's his work on black holes. And probably nowadays, this is, you know, well, it's hard to say which is the most important, but this is really important. So there's, there's actually a few papers this year in 1939 that he'd, he'd started working on sort of more astro-y type stuff. He started looking, for example, at the structure of, of neutron stars and trying to 
find equilibrium solutions, uh, solutions to general relativity that, that could describe a neutron star. And one of the things he realized there was, was that, that the, there was a maximum mass that a neutron star could have for it to be stable and in equilibrium. If you went beyond a certain mass, in his case, he said it was 0.7 solar masses. Actually, th that calcul that's a bit of an underestimate based on how he modeled the star, but the, the ideas were right. His physics was interesting. His, his physics was interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so so yeah, it's probably close. It's, it's a high, slightly higher number than that. But, but the, the, the fact is true. There is a maximum size that a neutron star can have and be stable, okay, and be in equilibrium. So he'd realized this, right? He said, okay, well, what if I go to higher masses? What happens then? Well, it, we know it can't be a neutron star. We know it can't be stable. Okay, so what happens? And he was the first person to really start to think about this. And he realized, he started studying, he realized that actually these things were going to collapse into black holes. He was the first person to really sort of model it in anything like a realistic scenario. And it's really cool, actually. Now with the sort of modern eye, you can really understand this paper in a kind of a much deeper way. And this is essentially what, what he had. So he set up a problem. Oppenheimer was a great physicist in that he had this, this knack for sort of cutting through, to, cutting out all the guff and zooming in on the real problem and doing the right, the interesting approximation that captured all the really essential physics. So in this case, he just took a spherically symmetric star. Okay, that's approximation clearly and he just assumed constant density again an approximation not realistic but enough to capture the, the really important physics and he realized that outside the star it would have a solution which was Schwarzschild's solution which is the solution for a spherically symmetric uh, distribution of anything in, in vacuum in, 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 uh, in general relativity it's, it's the solution that if you take it to its extreme you will get a black hole but he had this star sitting there. So it was only the exterior solution which, which sort of fed into Schwarzschild, right? So it wasn't a black hole yet. Inside the star, he realized that the geometry that, that inside the star was that of a, a basically a universe, a section of a, of a, of a cosmological space-time that had constant density, but actually it was a contracting universe. And so this model is the model of the star, which where you have this distribution of, of, uh, of, um, of, of mass, spherically symmetric distribution of, distribution of mass. It won't be stable. It will shrink. It will collapse. Eventually, that star will collapse to within its event horizon. OK, and then it now becomes a black hole. And he was the first person to really realize that, that process could happen. And the other thing is, he also talked about what it would look like. And it's, again, the first time I think anybody ever discussed this. He realized that if you were riding on the edge of the star as it was, as it, as it was um, collapsing, then, um, you know, let's say you take something like the sun and it was collapsed into form of a black hole. Take a few hours, right? Eventually it falls behind the event horizon and then it, there is no return after that. But, you know, it takes a few hours for that to happen, say. In the case, but for somebody watching far away, Oppenheimer realized it would actually take an infinite amount of time for that to happen. This is, this is, something, this is one of these weird quirks of when you look at a black hole, if you see somebody fall into a black hole, you actually, if you're watching from far away, you never see them fall in. That guy falls in and he's pretty, pretty quickly ends up turned to spaghetti. But you watch them, you never actually see them cross the event horizon of the black hole. So Oppenheimer realized all this. And this was, this was really a, a forerunner to... to very early days, people weren't taking black holes seriously, but Oppenheimer really started to do that. And Roger Penrose, when he got his 2020 Nobel Prize, really cited this paper as the real inspiration for his work in the 1960s with Stephen Hawking on, on, on black holes being, well, black holes, basically. So, yeah, his final paper. Oh, by the way, this is really quite amazing, actually. This paper right, this is the last of the ones that, that, we, uh, that we've talked about. The date it was published... I always forgot to say this. The date it was published, September the 1st, 1939. Do you know what else happened that day? 1939. Was it the, was it the start of the war? That was the day Hitler invaded Poland. It's just an amazing coincidence, right? And, that was, that's the, and this is really the last really significant paper that, that, that Oppenheimer write, pu wrote, published on the day that, that Hitler invaded Poland. <laughs> Check out the video description for some links relating to this video, to other videos we've done with Tony, and his book, Fantastic Numbers and Where to Find Them, A Journey to the Edge of Physics.
Anyone who's seen Tony's number file videos will be unsurprised to learn there are all sorts of huge numbers in this book, plus some fascinating and curious physics. As I said, links in the description.